Well, sometime in the 60s and in the 70s, uh, hippies started to come to know Jesus. They quit smoking weed and they started writing songs for God. Uh, they, they quit playing in their garage bands and they, 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 they started wanting to lift up the name of Jesus. Now, remember that these guys didn't have the advantage uh, of being like Corey here who grew up in the church singing hymns. Uh, these guys never went to Bible college or the seminary. They, they just left the bars, joined the church, and started singing songs for God. Now, some of the songs they wrote had what I would call questionable theology. Um, there was one guy by the name of Larry who wrote a song called UFO, and, it, and the chorus of the song talks about how Jesus is the unidentified flying object, okay? <laughs> Not found in the pages of scriptures last time I checked, Pastor Kevin. But there were some songs that these guys wrote that were remarkable. And this same guy, Larry, the guy that wrote that song, UFO, wrote a song called Outlaw. And in it, he, he, he begins every verse with the same line, some say he was. And then he kind of kick, picks out a, a characteristic of Jesus. And the first verse says it, some say he was an outlaw, that he roamed across the land with a band of unschooled ruffians and a few old fishermen, and no one knew just where he'd came from or exactly what he'd done, but they said it must be something bad to keep him on the run. So he compares Jesus to being an outlaw. And you could see that in the pages of Scripture. And then it goes on to say, some say he was a poet, and some say that because he did magic, he was a sorcerer. But then it gets to the last verse, and he says, some say he was the Son of Man, and that's who I say he is. And Larry's song, UFO, might have not gotten it, but this outlaw nailed it. Because, because he was asking the same question that a lot of people in our culture are asking. It, it, it's the question, who is Jesus? It's the question that, that, that Jesus asked of Peter after Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, you're this person, Elijah, and some, some say you're this person. And then Jesus turns to Peter and he said, but Peter, who do you say that I am? So since Easter to today, we've been trying to ask you, who do you say that Jesus is? Who is Jesus? How has he revealed himself to you? And so we want to consider in these days what this means. And we've been living, again, since Easter in six little verses found in Colossians chapter 1 that Paul wrote to a gathering of followers of Jesus. The church, word church simply means gathering, a gathering of followers of Jesus. Six little verses that we now call the Christ hymn because they describe beautifully who Jesus Christ is. It reveals Jesus uh, to us. And, and it begins with this simple declaration in Colossians 1, verse 15a. Read this with me. Ready? Go. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. And so for the last couple of weeks, with this hinge pins verse, we've been trying to say to you that if you want to know what the invisible God looks like, then all you have to do is look at Jesus. And that when we get stuck in our head trying to figure out trying to navigate between life and the Bible and what's true and what's not true, that this is the one thing you can count on. If you want to know what God is like, the God that we cannot see, then turn to Jesus, the God that we can see. Turn to him as is found in the most studied, reliable book that's ever been written about Jesus, the Bible particularly Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and see, does what we think about God, does it jive right with who Jesus is? Does it line up with Jesus as revealed to us in Scripture? And that when you and I are stuck, and we want to know, is God in this or not, what we need to ask ourselves is the, would Jesus say this or would Jesus do this test? And if you can run it through that test and it comes out on the other end okay, then, then sign on for it. That Jesus is the visible image. He's the concrete expression of this invisible God. Now, the truth is, because of bad teaching in the church and, frankly, bad teaching in our culture, and because of bad experiences that we have, we get trapped in what, what we've been calling in these days bad God views. So sometimes God is a grouchy old judge who's waiting, waiting to judge us when we mess up. And then, then sometimes he's the syrupy, sappy Santa who's doling out gifts to his kids, whether they're naughty or whether they're nice. Sometimes our bad God view is of God being like a referee who's waiting for us just to mess up so he can throw a flag at us and penalize us. Now, the teaching team forgot that it was Mother's Day when we picked our bad God view for this morning, because this morning, 
Now stay with me, moms. We're not going to beat you up. This is not about moms. We picked the absent father, all right? We're talking about deadbeat dads today on Mother's Day, all right? But stay with me on this one. Think about the dad that went out to buy a pack of cigarettes and a lottery ticket and never came home. And some people have a view of God being just like that. The philosophers of days gone by called it the clockwork God. They envisioned a, a, a clockmaker making a beautiful clock and winding it up and setting it on a shelf and walking away never to consider it again. And you have to ask yourself the question, when you go through life and you wonder whether God really cares about what you're going through, is God an absent father? Is he a clockwork God who set the, 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 the universe into motion and then just walked away from it, leaving us to figure it out ourselves? Well, let's use the run it through the Jesus test. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Was Jesus distant? Was, was he separated? Did he, did he call 12 guys and then just walk away from them? Or did Jesus walk with them intimately? Did he eat meals with them? We can imagine Jesus laughed with them around the fire pit at night. Jesus taught them and he corrected them. And if you see anything about Jesus, one of the things that you see is that he's intimately involved. He especially loved, listen to me, he especially loved the people that nobody else wanted and nobody else saw. Jesus loved to hang out with whores and prostitutes. He loved to hang out with uh, drunkards. He loved to hang out with liars and cheaters and tax collectors. Jesus was my kind of guy. He was anything but distant. And so this is a bad, a bad God view. So since we're considering who Jesus is and how the Bible reveals him to us, a, a couple of weeks ago, I began to talk about, on the second week of this series, about how Jesus is uh, the creator of everything. And that he made every one of us with God-given potential. Say that with me. God-given potential. Tap your neighbor and say, I've got God-given potential. Tell him right now. They might not know it. Tell them, you've got God-given potential, right? Wake somebody up if they're asleep. I, you need to help a preacher out here, all right? You've got God-given potential. God made you with great potential, the Bible says. And it says that Jesus put it there. But then the, the, the third week, last week, Jesus, or, or Pastor West, no, let's not get them confused. Pastor West, <laughs> whoo, almost messed bad theology there. Pastor West taught us that Jesus, I knew Jesus was in there somewhere. Pastor West taught us that Jesus is our sustainer, that he's the one that holds the whole universe together, or that as his dad taught us, that when life is all wrong, it can still be all right, because God holds it together. And how many of us this morning can testify that there have been seasons when everything was going all wrong, but that Jesus held it all together and it was all right? Can anybody other than me? Yeah, we, a few of us can. I'm glad. Yeah, so he's our sustainer. Now this week, we're going go to go to, to a different place. We're, we're, we're in a different portion of this six verses in Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to verse 18, the very beginning. And would you read it with me this morning? Colossians 18, uh, right at the very beginning. Ready, go. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. Now, think with me where we've been since Easter to now. First, we talked about how Jesus is God, and that's a pretty big deal. And we talked about how Jesus is the creator. That's a big deal. We talked about how Jesus is the sustainer. He holds it all together. That's a big deal. And now it kind of switches gears here, and it talks about how he's the head of the church. It seems to get a bit more earthy because it gets connected to you and to me. And here's what Paul says in this verse. He says, Jesus is the head of his body. Paul calls it later, another place, the body of Christ. He's the head of the church. Now, last week, Pastor West told us that, that God gets a bum rap, you know, these acts of God, hurricanes, tornadoes, and the rest. But the truth is, if, if God gets a bum rap, God's church, his body, is getting killed out there. And sadly, it's not just getting killed out there in the world, in the media. The church, the body of Christ Jesus, is getting killed from within by many of us, by me and by you. Because we often talk badly about this body of Jesus, the church. There's a little boy named Alex. He was standing out in the foyer. In some churches, they call it the narthex. And he was looking at a... At a, at a, at a sign that was on the wall that had a 
a placard with all the names of the men and women in that church who had died in the military service. And the pastor, you know, came up to him and he said, Alex, do you know what you're looking at? And he said, no. And he said, those are all the men and women who have died in the service. And Alex said, which one? The 830, the 10, or the 1130 <laughs> service? And there's a lot of people, a lot of people's perception of, of the church is that it's a place to go and die, right? <laughs> but it gets even worse than that. It really does. This week I was thinking about the ways in which those of us who, who love Jesus and, 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 and who try to love the church sometimes think about the church. And, and I came up with two big categories. And one of them is what I'm calling the headless horseman category. And that's that, 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 that the church is a body and we think of it as an organization. And, and instead of the church being run by the Bible, it's run by Robert's Rules of Order. And so we think of the church right next alongside of the Rotary Club and the Qantas Club and Little League and PTA. Another way of looking at the church that's all wrong is not to, 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 to only look at the body, but only to look at the head. And I think this is the one that most people in church are guilty of. They love Jesus. So I love that song we sang last week, Jesus be the center of my life. And we say, Jesus be the center of my life, but we really are just putting up with the church. Can I testify here for a minute? I went to Bible college four years. I went to seminary for four years, worked on my master's and finished it. I was a pastor for eight years before the Holy Spirit revealed to me that, that I was guilty of this kind of, uh, kind of talking head understanding of the church. I loved Jesus. I just didn't really care much for the church. It paid my, my bills. That's it. And, and over the last 18 years, really, since I've been at Grace Church, I have fallen in love with the body of Christ, the church. You see, what we don't want to do is separate the head from the body. We don't want to separate our, our love for Jesus from our love for Jesus' people. Because here's the truth. When I said yes to Jesus, guess what? I said yes, whether I like it or not, to Jesus' people. And that's you and me. We're the best we got. That's right. This is about as good as it gets, right? So the teaching team was meeting this week. And, and what we decided is we were trying to figure out how do we connect all of this to help Grace Church on this Sunday? We came up with this principle. It's on the screen. Look at it with me. Why don't you read this aloud with me? Ready? Go. One of the best ways we show that we love Jesus is by loving his body, the church. You see, we can say we love Jesus, but what is the way to love him? One of the best ways to love him is by loving his body, the church. By loving his body, the church. We don't want to take Jesus, the head of the church, and separate it from the body of the church. So the teaching team went to Matthew's biography of Jesus. And we found two things that Christ followers can do, that you can do and that I can do, that we can practice that will help us not only love Jesus, but as we're loving Jesus, love his church, the body. So here they are. Number one, first fill in the blank. I love Jesus, or I love the church, by protecting the unity of the church. I love the church by protecting the unity of the church. When, when you read the New Testament, kind of the back fourth of the Bible or the back third of the Bible. When you read the New Testament, there are 13 letters in here from the Apostle Paul, same guy that wrote Colossians. And they're written to churches like the one in Colossians. They're written to places like Philippi. They're also written to people like Timothy and Titus. They were individual letters. And if you were to read all 13 of them uh, repeatedly, one of the things that you'd notice is that one of the major themes in Paul is unity. Over and over again, Paul says things like this. Hey, quit disagreeing with one another. Start getting along with one another. One of my most favorites is found in the book of Philippians where he outs two women that are fighting in church and he names them in this letter. And so for the last 2,000 years, we've been reading about these two women that fought in church. And Paul tells them, just stop it. Just stop it. But it wasn't just Paul who cared about unity, so did Jesus. And Jesus, over and over again, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus, over and over again, talked about how precious our relationship is with one another. Because let me remind you, the word church simply means gathering. It's not the building. Remember, there were no buildings for 350, the first 350 years of the church. 
The church is the gathered people. It's our relationship with one another. And so Jesus over and over and over again said, forgive one another, protect the love that you have for each other. And in one place, he gets very precise in teaching us how to get along with one another. It's found in Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Let me read it for you because it's a long section of Scripture. Here's what Jesus said. He says, if another believer sins against you, Go privately and point out the offense. Let me stop right there. Okay, listen, everybody look at me. Here's what Jesus is saying. We're going to hurt each other. Is that news to anybody? Even, in, even when you say yes to Jesus, the perfect one, we don't become perfect. We're going to hurt one another. And so Jesus begins with the assumption. This gives me some hope, right? He begins with the assumption that believers hurt each other. And he says, you go to them. Now, listen, let's keep reading. He says, if the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So that's step two. Step three, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, now here's where it gets tough. Treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Jesus is saying this stuff is so important. Here it goes. He continues, because I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Now read this last line with me. Ready? Go. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. So Jesus like gets out the paint by number set. And he says, I want to go step by step on how my people can protect the unity of their relationships. And Jesus assumes that we're going to get on each other's nerves. He assumes that we're going to hurt one another. And listen to me, the first thing Jesus says is, go to the person alone. Jesus doesn't say, go post it on Facebook. Hello. He doesn't say, tweet it out to all of your friends. You won't believe what a jerk Pastor George is, right? He says, what are you supposed to do? You go to the person alone. Now, can I tell you, in my experience, 95% of the conflict that happens in the body of Christ gets resolved if we would do that one thing, just that one thing. I bump into people. I've been here 18 years, so I've had plenty of opportunities to offend lots of people, right? And in 18 years, I've bumped into people at Target, Walmart, wherever, and I bump into them and I say, didn't didn't we used to hang out together at church? Yeah. Why'd you leave? Well, I got mad at you. Oh, really? I said, well, why didn't you come talk to me about it? Now, maybe it says more about me that they didn't. I don't know. But the Bible says that that the first thing we do is we go to the person alone. It assumes that we're going to get on each other's nerves. It assumes that we're going to offend each other. It assumes that we're going to sin against one another. And how much conflict in the body of Christ would be done away with if we would just do that one thing? And then Jesus goes on to say, now there's some increasingly severe kinds of things that needs to happen, but Jesus thinks restoration is so important that Jesus kind of lines it out so that we, I mean, there's not much wiggle room in this teaching. And Jesus, now let me say this to you. Jesus says here, it's it's the role of the one who's been offended to go to the person who's done the offending. You know why that is? I thought about that this week. It's because sometimes when we offend people, we don't even know it. And so we're sitting around letting that person take up space in our head, and we're angry, and we just want them to catch on fire, you know? And they're just going happily about their life. They didn't know. Now, here's the deal. For 35 years, I've been following Jesus, and I've been on both sides of this equation, offender and offended. And is it scary when you practice this stuff? Absolutely. Does it sometimes get complicated? Sure. Sure. But can I tell you what happens when we at least try to obey the spirit of what Jesus is talking about here? I've seen whole families come back together. I've seen marriages that I thought would never, ever get fixed get unified and were stronger than ever. I've seen business partners who wouldn't even talk to one another who practiced this and things began to mend and they began to heal and things began to be profitable in their work together. And most importantly, I've seen churches come together and do amazing things for Jesus and his community when they practice this stuff of protecting the unity of the church. So how are you doing at this one? 
Do you remember, do you remember when Saul, the guy that was Paul, the guy that wrote this letter, was in, in, in Acts chapter 9, he's riding on his horse, he's been killing Christians, and all of a sudden Jesus shows up to, shows up to him, and, and he falls off, and he's blinded, and Jesus says these words to him. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, what, what was Saul doing? He was killing Christians, but what did Jesus say? You're persecuting me. Jesus says, when you hurt my people, you hurt who? You hurt him. You hurt me. And so, so if, if we want to, if we want to, if we want to love Jesus, then love his church. Don't listen to me, Grace Church. Please don't talk bad about other churches in this community and in this world. If you don't, if you don't like the way somebody's doing something, just shut up. Just shut up. Protect the unity of the church. Number two, second way we love the church and therefore love Jesus is by joining him in his mission, by joining Jesus in his mission. Can I remind you that what our biggest battle is in the Christian life, it's not against the devil. And it's not even against the culture. Our biggest battle is against ourselves. You remember the old saying, I, I looked in the mirror and I saw the enemy and the enemy was who? The enemy was me. Isn't our biggest struggle in life selfishness and ego and pride? We want our way. And can I tell you what Jesus' antidote is to wanting our way? It's being a servant. It's hard to want your way when you're washing somebody's feet. And so Jesus says, if you want to love me and you want to love my church, then will you join me in washing feet? Will you join me in this world? And when we do that, we're reflecting who God is. Because if you read this book, the Bible, the Bible says from Genesis to Revelation that the God that we serve is a missionary God. Listen to me. He's a missionary God. He's a God who is always sending. God sent his son into this world. And Jesus taught and preached and healed and died and rose from the dead. He's a missionary God. And that same Jesus said that he was going to return to heaven and that God would send the Holy Spirit to God's people so that God's people then could be a sent people. Have you seen around here the words reach, connect, form, and what's the last one? Send, send. It's because we believe that God's called us as a church to reach people who are outside of these walls, who are very far from God, that's why we do all this stuff from diaper ministries to, 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 uh, to the third Saturday outreach to fall festivals and the rest because we want to reach our community with the love of Jesus. And then we want to help them connect to Jesus and his church. And then we want to help them become more and more like Jesus, be formed like him. And finally, we want to send us out into the world to make a difference. And when we do that, we're joining Jesus because Jesus told us to. It's the Great Commission. Look at Matthew Chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Why don't you read this with me? Ready? Go. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What did Jesus tell us to do here? He said, join me in my great mission in this world. One of the things I love about our particular part of the body of Christ is we believe that Jesus is already at work in every human being. I experienced that this week. Tuesday, I had to go to Atlanta just for the day. So after uh, writing the sermon uh, at noon, I left and caught an airplane to Atlanta. And I was going there because one of my best buds was being installed as the president of a mission organization. And so I wanted to be there for the celebration on Tuesday night, and then I flew back, first flight home on, on, uh, on, on Wednesday morning. So I was, went down, and because I fly a lot, I, I got the exit row seat. So I'm sitting on the exit row seat, which is like the poor man's first class, right? You get to stretch out your legs. So I'm sitting on the exit row seat, and I'm thinking, I've been up since about 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm thinking, I'm going to get a nice little nap, right? So I'm sitting in that chair, I got my legs stretched out, and Pam came and sat next to me. And Pam had a different agenda than I did. She wanted to talk. She even told me, I'm a little chatty. I said, it's all right. So Pam started telling me her life story. 
I mean, she was disabled because she has all kinds of plates in her neck. She's about my age, so she's very, very young, about my age. She had, <laughs> had, these, she had these plates in her neck, and um, so she couldn't work. She was disabled. Um, she was a grandmother, and I'm a grandfather, and so she started telling me about her granddaughter. She was going to pick up her granddaughter, and they were going to spend six weeks together here in Cape Coral, which is where she lives. Pam told me that she lives by Sunsplash, and I thought to myself, that's pretty close to our church. Maybe you should invite her, but I wanted to take a nap, right? <laughs> and it's like the Holy Spirit's going, hey, I'm here, I'm working, do your part, George, join me, but I wanted to take a nap. So then she tells me that she had to bury her cat that day. I mean, she'd had this cat for 12 years. We have this pause ministry, and I know, I mean, what, what the animals can mean to us. And, and so, I mean, my heart is bleeding, but I still want to take a nap. <laughs> right? I just want to take a nap. And so, so, so I, I'm trying to, to doze, and I'm reading a little bit, and Pam's still talking. And, and, and then all of a sudden, uh, we're, I, I, the, the, the steward or the they come out over the loudspeakers and they say, we're getting ready to land. And the Holy Spirit says, really? What else do you want me to do, right? And so finally I sit up my chair and I said, Pam, uh, I've not been telling you the whole truth. I said, Pam, I'm a, I'm a pastor uh, at a church right around the corner from where you live. And you know what Pam said to me? She said, that's an answer to prayer. I've been wanting to go back to church and she told me her whole crazy, kind of crazy religious life, all this judgmentalism, and, and she got divorced, and she got kicked out of the church, and I said, have I got a church for you? It's filled with the people nobody else wants or sees. It's filled with broken people who just know that they serve an amazing God. I gave her my business card, and as I was walking off the plane, I heard, heard the Holy Spirit say, sucker. <laughs> I was loving Jesus and I was loving his church because I was joining him in his mission. Amen. How many of us want the presence of God in our life? I, I know I do. Look at the verses here at the very end. Look at what Jesus said at the end of Matthew 18, the verse we studied earlier, and at the end of Matthew 28, Jesus says, I am there among them and I will be with you always. Now stay with me on this one. These are the two times that I can find in all of the New Testament where Jesus promises to be with you. This has been the hardest five days of my life. My youngest son is in trouble again. And we might not see him for a long time. And I didn't want to be here today. I wanted to sit in my home and just pull the cover up over my head. But the Lord told me a couple of things. Number one, he said, it's still true, so get up and do your job. But the other thing I came by to tell you is that Cheryl and I and our family are walking through the darkest night of our lives. We have experienced his presence. It's unexplainable. We are knowing peace and joy in the midst of the pain. It still hurts like hell. You want God's presence in your life. He wants to give it to you. He wants you to know it through the thick and through the thin because he loves you. Let's stand for prayer. So Jesus, first of all, forgive us when we've either treated the church like an organization or when we've disembodied the church from the, the head of the church, Jesus. We confess to you that 
Both are probably things that we've been guilty of. Jesus, thank you that you promise your presence. We you guaranteed your presence when we protect the unity of your precious body, the church, and when we join you in your mission. And so, Lord Jesus, this morning, I pray for all of us, some of us who desperately need your presence in their lives. I pray that you would meet with us here. For you are the sovereign God. You are the sovereign God. And you've said that you'll walk with us through the good and through the difficult. And so this morning, Lord, we declare your goodness even when life doesn't feel good. We would declare again, once again, God, that even when things are all wrong, it can be all right because you've said, I will never, ever, ever leave you or forsake you. And I pray, God, you would work that into the hearts of some of your children today. We worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to sing a little bit. We've got about five or seven minutes, so we're not going to rush off. Altar's open if you want to come and pray here about this or anything else. If you need somebody to pray with you, you just come and lift a hand. Some of our prayer teams will be here. If you've never given your life to Jesus, I'm going to be over here by the cross, and I'd love to pray with you. So let's just worship. We're going to sing this song that we learned earlier today about, sovereign, about God's sovereignty because it's true. I'm telling you this. Don't feel sorry for your pastor or his family. Please don't. Pray for us. Pray for my son, Nathan. Just pray for him. Because God is good. He is good. Even when life is hard, he's good. So let's sing.